Hello, and welcome to this IAC virtual conference. Um, if you're watching this in the future at some point, I hope you got a chance to check out other sessions and you've been able to really participate in the awesome slate of speakers and the incredible wealth of knowledge within the Intertribal Agricultural Council's virtual conference space. Um, my name is Mariah Gladstone and I'm the founder of Indigi Kitchen. I'm going to share my screen and just put up some slides. Oh, the host has disabled screen sharing. So I cannot put up. Okay, let me take a look here. All right, you should be able to now. All right. Here we go. I'll pop that up there. And Oh, this is not good. I can hear myself talking. Give me a second. Hold on for technical difficulties because Okay. I'm just glitching. Give me a second. Fixed it. Only funny is if I modified in an old presentation and I had narrations on that presentation. So I didn't want those to automatically go through and play as I'm trying to talk. Um, so my name is Mariah Gladstone and I'm the founder of Indigi Kitchen. Um, I am I'm Skepi Bikani, Blackfeet from Montana, which is where I was raised, um, but enrolled Cherokee in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Um, I have a degree from Columbia in environmental engineering, which doesn't explain at all why I got into native food and food revitalization. Um, and I'm currently working on my master's in environmental science at SUNY ESF in Syracuse, New York. Um, Albeit I'm doing that digitally right now. So I am actually back home in beautiful Montana on the Blackfeet Reservation where my internet is limited. So I hope that this presentation is minimally glitchy and my screen and my voice does not skip around too much. Um, I talk about the work that I do in food revitalization as uh, placed in this historical context. So. Um, when we look at the history of the United States and the colonial occupation that we have dealt with, the control of indigenous food systems has always been incredibly uh, important and prioritized by colonial governments, both the United States and Canada. Um, you can see that some of George Washington's first orders to his general were actually to burn Haudenosaunee villages and fields and crop stores in order to prevent them from planting more. This was not only an effort to control food system for the present and at that moment in time, but also to really shape the destruction of food systems for the ongoing future. Um, this played out in different ways across the continent. Of course, when we look at the 1850 Commissioner of Indian Affairs report, it was written that it is cheaper in the end to feed the whole flock for a year than to fight them for a week. Um, prioritizing a destruction of indigenous food systems and 
relating to this transition to government dependency for food. Um, of course, this manifested in a variety of different ways, but one of the huge ways was the decimation of bison populations on the plains. Of course, bison being shot for sport off of the new trains, like you see in this image here, but also um, in damming of waterways that cut fish out of the diets from uh, upstream tribes and disturb the irrigation systems of downstream tribes. You look at uh, regulations that have disconnected us from our traditional foraging territories. You look at the relocation of nations to places where the traditional crops would not grow, whether for soil reasons or climate reasons. Um, and of course, this forced a lot of our nations into dependency on food government sponsored food system, ration, of course. Um, this is a quote that I think is particularly striking um, because it's of course um, talking about how complete that decimation of our food system was um, and how the colonial governments used that to exert control on our people. Um, so, Let's see. This is one of the most um, dramatic ways I have of illustrating the destruction of the bison population. Um, estimates have numbers pre-contact around 20 million. Um, there's some numbers as high as 40 million and some closer to 15 million. So 20 million is a pretty solid estimate. Um, by 1889, you look at numbers around a thousand. Um, some places, uh, some numbers have those plunging lower than a thousand at one point. And so of course, bison restoration efforts were begun at that point. And now our number is around 500,000. Um, we know that uh, government policies really forced a lot of people into um, ranching and really wanted to uh, take up this um, Western or this Western European uh, cattle and this idea of ranching and farming and that type of strictly um, straight rows agriculture as the pinnacle of what it meant to be civilized in a rural area. Um, there was, of course, really harsh things written by uh, Senator Oz, who was, of course, um, the, the mind behind the Dawes Act. Um, and of course, the idea was that hunter-gatherer people, of which many indigenous nations were part of, were um, being lazy by living off of the land and not working the land. Um, of course, we know that many types of working of the land in terms of killing and um, overgrazing can be really damaging to the land itself. And so it's ironic, perhaps, that that was how our, our laziness was factored into the Dawes Act and the destruction, the allotment of lands. But we also know that there are many native people that are ranchers, that ranch cattle, um, that find ways of incorporating uh, traditional indigenous land management practices into non-native ranching practices and being able to uh, sustainably manage that and practice these forms of regenerative agriculture. I know it's a buzzword, but a lot of the times it is uh, incorporating indigenous land management techniques into the way that modern farming and ranching is done. Um, we talked about this dependence on government food systems and the shift, of course, to ration. We see ration tickets, which were um, one of the family's most highly prized possessions at one time, because that is where you got most of your food from. And it was from rations and this transition to foods that we did not recognize as foods like flour and uh, sugar, lard, dry milk, canned goods, um, these things that a lot of our food systems have been shaped by. Also, of course, from this that we get fry bread. Um, and so we rapidly transitioned from our traditional diets, diets high in protein, uh, complex carbohydrates, vitamins, fresh or dried uh, fruits and vegetables to diets high in empty carbohydrates and uh, omega-6. Uh, you guys probably recognize something like this. This is 
kind of classic commodity food. This is things that um, we still get today on our reservations as part of the FDIPR program, the food distribution program on Indian reservations. So in some places we get a little bit more variety, a little bit more excitement in there. Uh, but a lot of the times it is a lot of foods designed to be shelf stable for a very long time, transported of course without refrigeration and uh, prepared in pretty minimal uh, circumstances. You can prepare this you know, on a stove top if that, I mean, the pasta is pretty much what you're looking at or cans of um, vegetables that you can throw into a pan on the stove. Um, so you can of course make this on a hot plate. Um, a lot of these of course are, don't have anything to do with our traditional food. Even the cornmeal there is not a traditional way that native people would have eaten corn because any native tribe that ate corn would have nixtamalized it first. They would have treated it with wood ash or lied the corn so that it was more digestible and the actual nutrients could be extracted. Um, it gets a lot into the nutritional uh, brilliance of our ancestors, but it also looks at this rapid transition to the diets that a lot of us or a lot of our parents and grandparents grew up on. And the reason I actually got involved in all of this was because of an examination of health outcomes that affect Native people. Um, we look at diabetes rates that are far greater than the non-Native population. Um, we have very high obesity rates. Um, we know that when Native people get diabetes, we're much more likely to die from it than non-Native people. And um, in Montana, I see our life expectancies as Native folks, both male and female, around 20 years less than the non-Native population. Um, and this really pushed me to get involved with a lot of the work around revitalizing indigenous food system. Um, we know that there are a lot of native producers out there that are producing traditional foods. And we're dealing not only with native populations that don't necessarily know how to prepare our traditional foods, but also non-native populations that have no idea what foods originated in on this continent, that there are native producers out there making them and what to do with them. Um, even folks that want to support native producers don't always know how to support them because they don't know what to do with traditional or indigenous foods to this continent, which is why I got involved in the work that I do. Um, of course, we're all fairly familiar at this conference with the term food sovereignty. Um, food sovereignty has about four different pillars that I talk about when I discuss the definition. It is of course, the right of people to access healthy foods. So foods that are going to support our basic building blocks of uh, life, give us the calories needed to function, give us that combination of fats, proteins, carbohydrates, um, and of course, vitamins and minerals and everything that we need to actually support our daily wellness. Um, we look at affordability. If the poorest person in our communities cannot afford to eat, then our food is not affordable. Um, we want to make sure that we have access to healthy food for everyone and affordable food for everyone. That should not be a radical idea. Um, and it was a foundation of our, um, our communities in, in the past. And it should be a foundation of our communities as we look at food sovereignty today. Um, of course, if there was someone that was a particularly good hunter in the community, they were expected to supply uh, poor people, people that were not able, disabled people, elder people with food as well. And it was that contributions from your best hunters in the community would help supply your poor community members or those that were not able to feed themselves with food. Um, and that is something that I think is so important to think about. Um, I also think about this because of the way that this principle has been incorporated at the last uh, Intertribal Agricultural Council's uh, annual meeting and the conference that took place. And I remember the huge banquet that we had using foods from native producers and having this huge banquet, but also with the leftovers, with those plates that did not get eaten at the conference, packaging those up and taking them to the homeless shelter in Las Vegas. And I remember the discussion about that as supporting our values as Native people, feeding ourselves and knowing that we can feed ourselves, but also 
being able to feed those that are not, that don't have those means to. So think about that um, as we put this into food sovereignty. Um, of course, culturally appropriate. Food is part of our cultural identity and the food that we have access to should support that. Um, this is why I work so much with traditional foods and helping recognize those ancestral connections. But also we can look at this as, um, you know, I could probably make an entire menu and it could be healthy, affordable meals for in school lunches. And it was based entirely off of print bugs and it was sustainable and it was healthy and it was affordable, but it's not culturally appropriate because we don't really recognize bugs as food um, in most of this continent. <laughs> um, and also something that I know a lot of folks are working on now is using sustainable methods and policy and the right to govern our own sustainable methods and policy. Being able to write those food and agricultural codes, like I know the folks at the Inter, uh, Indigenous Food and Agriculture Initiative are working on down at University of Arkansas School of Law, being those policy wonks that are writing that model food and agricultural code that help tribes regulate their own food and ag systems on reservation. We are sovereign nations and regulating and governing those things is part of acting like that. Um, these are the pillars of food sovereignty. It encompasses a lot and there's so much work that people can do on any aspect of this. Um, so there's a lot of folks working on this access part about regaining food sovereignty, about gaining that ability to feed ourselves. Um, but there's also that restoration of knowledge that needs to occur because of this historical framework that our food is in. Uh, we look at our food systems as being something that was very intentionally taken away from us and that work to get it back has to be very intentional too. Um, why I worked so hard on actually reteaching recipes about traditional foods. So my work is actually very much using digital media. I was in the business of distance learning before it was cool or mandated. Um, and so I work on this uh, digital media, this digital platform, creating cooking videos, creating recipes using ancestral food, ancestral foods from around the continent. Um, I'm actually in the process of collecting recipes and um, showcasing traditional recipes from other locations in the country and building this database of indigenous recipes. If you have one that you really want showcased and documented and shared with people, send it to me. I would love to talk to you. Um, I also uh, think this is so important because it helps native folks that didn't grow up reading recipe books. It helps them see how easy it is to restore and prepare traditional foods. Um, and a lot of people have this idea or they know how to make some traditional foods, but they're reserved just for ceremony time. They're reserved for special occasions rather than being seen as something we can incorporate into our everyday diets. And so that's why I work so hard on this um, because all these folks working on access need that support of communities that know what to do with those foods when they get access to them. We need people that know what to do with their traditional foods so that native producers that want to be working in traditional food production have communities that they can help supply. They have uh, consumers, they have folks that know what to do with their foods, are interested in buying their foods. Um, we know that our grocery stores will not keep fresh food stock if when they stock it, it's not selling. So we need to make sure that we are informed um, and healthy consumers as well. But part of that is restoring that knowledge. And I said, it has to be really intentional work. Um, of course, this is also the work that I do. I think this photo actually gives me anxiety now because I'm like six feet, six feet. <laughs> um, in non-pandemic times, I'm typically doing uh, demonstrations, cooking classes. I've been doing those things from my own kitchen actually. So I've been able to continue that work and doing demonstrations from my own house and doing that all digitally. Um, it is really fun to be able to be in person with people and to have people share in the preparation of a meal together, which I also think is part of this indigenous way of cooking is sharing in those responsibilities and all feeling part of making uh, one dish and being able to share in that and taste it together. Um, but this is the work that I do. It's all about getting people really excited about traditional foods. And 
I also, of course, make videos, which I mentioned. Um, classic video example, something I do is just teaching people how to prepare maple sugar from maple syrup. A lot of people know what to do with maple syrup in terms of adding it to pancakes, but don't necessarily know how to cook with it. Um, and so just simply making a video that shows people that they can just transform it in their very own kitchens and have granulated sugar by the end of it and a big pot of maple sugar. Um, this is how all of my videos are very short, very easy for people to share. Um, hopefully hold people's attention long enough for them to realize how easy things can be. Um, but also to help incorporate something different and something traditional into their diet. You can bake with maple sugar instead of granulated sugar. You can support local native producers with it. Um, you can help motivate people to care for maple trees that are threatened by climate change. And you can really push away from a lot of the destructive sugar industry that has led to so much uh, destruction in this hemisphere. Um, so I also make things that uh, look a little bit more bougie, um, but they're things that are really easy for folks to make. So I, um, you know, on the, let's see, on the left, this is an elk backstrap actually, um, elk season in Montana. So we're preparing fun uh, dishes with a whole bunch of elk, making our own elk sausage, going to make elk jerky, going to make pemmican. Um, and the other one is an example of using traditional foods and foods that we would have had access to, bell peppers, peanuts, zucchini, maple vinegar, um, trying to think chilies, uh, wild garlic, these things that we would have had access to, to make a recipe that's not typically considered Native American. And this is actually a pad thai, but it's made with zucchini noodles and it's made with maple vinegar instead of rice vinegar. And I'm thinking about all the things that regular pad thai has in it originated with Native people and with Native agricultural systems. And I'm trying to reclaim some of that and really make foods that people recognize as foods. I've even taken zucchini and sliced it like into little discs and you can make little zucchini pizza bites, kind of look like bowl bites, but of course they're way healthier for you. Um, taking foods that we know that our ancestors have known and turn them into things that kids can be comfortable eating because they see them as food and the parents can prepare quickly. And when they get home from work or when they get out from the fields, um, they get out from um, doing all of the other busy things that we have to do with our lives today. Um, this is my goal, of course, <laughs> for Native people to really look at traditional foods, traditional land management, traditional food systems, and incorporate that into their everyday diets for restoring health physically, um, also mentally, being able to have that connection to our landscapes, being able to have those connections to the producers that are creating those food systems, and being able to really recognize that inherent value of our identities through that ancestral wisdom and hopefully see fry bread instead of our key native food, um, but really see fry bread as evidence of our survival, something that got us through this period of time that would have otherwise meant starvation and maybe keep fry bread for really special occasions and incorporate traditional food everywhere else into our diet. So this is me, this is Indigo Kitchen. If you're interested in following any of the work that I do, if you're interested in recipes, I'm of course online at indigokitchen.com. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm on YouTube. And again, I'm looking for traditional recipes, things that people want to showcase and document and be able to share with their communities but might not have the video resources to do so. Please let me know, I am happy to attempt to create your recipes, probably on a Zoom call while you're yelling at me on how to do them. Um, and to be able to really showcase that work so that we can create that digital database of indigenous recipes, of indigenous cooking videos, and continue that work as we restore our food systems. I don't know if we have anyone that has any questions, but that is where I'm at. Thank you guys. All right, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking, uh, you know, your valuable time out of your day. And we just wanted to let you know that, of course, your your time and your wisdom and everything that you're willing to share is absolutely appreciated by all of us here at the IAC. So 
Without any further ado, I refreshed my screen here a couple of times, both on CVent and um, through Zoom. We don't see any uh, questions coming in. So uh, with that being said, why don't you uh, just reminisce about a time or two where you've inspired someone to maybe even change a small piece of their lifestyle that's now made a big impact in their life? Seriously, hit me with questions if you got them. Uh, seeing no questions here. Um, Hi, what's your favorite yeah. way to prepare a squirrel? I'm sorry? I don't have one, partially because I haven't trapped a squirrel. OK. <laughs> but if anyone has any good squirrel recipes, send them to indigikitchen at gmail.com. Yeah, I got another question for you. Where's the coolest place you've traveled um, to, you know, do your work there? Sorry, what was that? So where's one of the more unique places uh, that you've traveled to, uh, to do the work that you do? I was actually really, really lucky to um, travel with the IAC and the American Indian Foods Program um, and work at a really cool trade show that we we're using to support native producers in Japan at um, their showcase event over there. It was a seafood event, um, but I got to go and prepare some of the food that was native harvested fish. And we got to bring wild rice over to Japan, which blew Japanese people's minds. It was awesome. Um, and be able to really showcase this incredible native food that we have coming from Indian country. And uh, so it was really cool, um, but I've got to go to a lot of different states. I've got to work with a lot of different tribes um, help kind of shape some of their curriculum, but also be able to present teach cooking classes um, everywhere from Washington to Vermont to you know, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma. So it's been really fun. And I'm, I'm really happy because I also see a lot of these things uh, show up in my inbox, when I know people are using my recipes, uh, because people are posting pictures, they're tagging in DigiKitchen, they're sending me messages and they're saying, hey, I tried your bison butternut lasagna recipe. I did it this way because this is the ingredient that I had access to. And I'm like, awesome, it's so good. I'm so happy that people are using this information. Um, I think that's something great about using this digital media platform that uh, I don't think cookbook uh, cookbook authors get to see quite as much because you can't tag a cookbook in something, but you can tag uh, food blogs, you can tag recipe pages like that. I love people sharing things, um, getting to see them tag their grandmas in my Facebook posts when I'm putting out recipes and say, let's make this on Friday, <laughs> um, which is really cool because it happens a lot and I can kind of see that web of connection across Indian country. Um, and that makes me really excited. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, now we have another question that's come up here, um, which says, are all of your demonstrations on the Indigi Kitchen website or YouTube? And maybe you might want to post that page up there again one more time. Yeah, sure thing. Um, let me actually just pop that right back up there. Um, put that up. 
Um, yeah, my uh, I have main thing that's online is the short little cooking videos like I showed with the maple sugar. Um, I have those for a lot of different recipes. That's all on my Facebook, YouTube, and webpage. Um, with a lot of the cooking demonstrations, um, I haven't done a lot of long form things yet. I've done a lot of those for conferences and they've been recorded. So for example, you can go to the National Indian Health Board website and you can see a uh, food preparation for a wild rice pilaf. Um, but I need to do more of them in my own house. And part of that has been my own discomfort with recording my face and then being responsible for editing it later. Um, I was trying not to go all Indigenous Rachel Ray on things, but I definitely have videos that show my hands in that very top-down style, um, preparation style. Perfect. Thank you for that um, question and answer. Next one I see coming in is, what is your favorite food to prepare slash incorporate into your meals? I love preparing different types of squash because they're so versatile. Um, I mean, you can use zucchinis for everything from making pad thai to little pizza bites to zucchini bread. And you can make essentially dessert bread out of zucchinis. Um, and you can use winter squash like pumpkins, of course, for everything from pie to made a soup last night. It was like a curry lentil sweet potato soup using like a pumpkin base for it. Um, you can open pumpkins or acorn squash or butternut squash and you can stuff them with wild rice and meat and veggies and like make little bowls out of the squash themselves that's awesome um, spaghetti squash is of course awesome and versatile um, you can roast it with maple syrup and you can have basically little candied maple squash which are delicious and sweet um, I love I love working with different types of squash because it's so versatile um, but there's so many other fun things that I get to incorporate too. Um, obviously I use a lot of wild rice um, and it's because one of my family members married someone from Red Lake. And so I grew up with a lot of wild rice in my life, even though I'm out in Montana and um, so many, so many fun indigenous foods. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, here's another question came in. Says, hi, Mariah. I do similar work creating recipes for my tribe's new food sovereignty project. What have you found are the biggest keys to getting your target audience to actually make these recipes? How do you measure your progress? Yeah, I think that making sure that I'm using um, ingredients that are accessible to every community member or uh, making sure that I'm including substitutes that are uh, appropriate. So for example, I've made recipes that I'm preparing using like the wild berries that I have around here. Um, but I'm making sure that I can say, you can do this with blueberries and raspberries that you buy at the grocery store too. If that's what you have for it. But you can also make this with the wild berries that you have where you are. So I'm trying to really incorporate those things. I use a lot of sunflower oil or avocado oil because those are indigenous oils. But you can use light olive oil for the same purposes, a healthy oil. Um, and it's not necessarily from this continent, but it's something that people have easier access to and is generally more affordable um, if they're buying it like that. So just try getting people really excited about things. Um, and as weird as it sounds, like baking pretty pictures of your foods go a long way. Um, being able to have like nice portrait mode pictures on your food when you're posting it lets people see that and go, oh, I want that. How do I make it? And if they can watch, um, you know, a minute and 30 second video, and they can see all the steps happen right there. It takes it from, that's too fancy. I could never do that to, oh, oh yeah, I get that. I understand how to do that. Um, part of the problem with recipe books and when sending people recipes is trying to explain things in language that makes it really understandable. So I don't know how to really explain how to cut up a butternut squash in the exact way I want to make the lasagna noodles. But if I am using a video, I can go, yep, like this, you're cutting off the skin, cutting it like that, and then right into noodles. Um, that makes sense. And so I just try making things seem really easy 
which a lot of the times they are. Um, I use language that I expect our community members will understand rather than very French-based language, which a lot of cooking is. Um, and I don't tell people what not to do, what not to eat. Um, I try making them excited about all of our traditional foods rather than saying like, stay away from that fry bread, that's bad for you. Don't eat those Cheetos, don't eat that Kool-Aid or whatever. Um, I think a lot of people roll into our communities and when they're health focused, they go, don't do that, don't do that. How come you Indians keep eating trash food? Like, and it turns into attacks on people's family. It makes us sound like we don't have self-control and it disregards this entire history of disconnection from our food system. And so I just work on positive reinforcement, getting people excited and they try it and they love it and they prepare it again and again and again. Perfect. All right, here's another one that says, not a question, but I would like to have you present to our Title VI directors. I administer the Title VI senior nutrition programs across the country. We have 605 centers in 405 tribes and villages. It would be a great opportunity for us. I had to think you're going to be traveling up to Alaska here before too long, Mariah. <laughs> I have wanted to go to Alaska so much and to film uh, recipes up in Alaska because there's so much awesome, really specific culinary knowledge that comes from Alaska Native villages. Um, for that person, I have a booking request form on my webpage. Uh, so fill that out. It's just a really quick little form. And then I can just forward it to my booking agent. And she deals with a lot of those details, um, whether it's a physical trip at some point in the future or whether it's an online dream session. Um, I would love to be a part of it. So reach out to me through that. And that's one of the easiest ways or shoot me an email and digikitchen at Gmail and that'll help For anyone that's interested out there. I'm always honored to be a part of anyone's uh, local culinary revitalization in their communities. Great. Okay. Here's another one. I have a question about meal prep. Are there any tips and tricks on how to better prepare traditional meals? I usually have to wait until the weekends to prepare these meals for my family, but would love to know how to expedite the process. Yeah, um, there's a lot of things that, of course, in our communities, uh, traditionally, um, pre-contact, we dedicated a lot of time to food preparation and storage and harvest, and now in nine to five world that we work in, we don't have all of that time. Um, but we do have a lot of tools in our modern kitchen that make a lot of those things easier um, or um, at least make it so we can set it aside, let it do something while we're still doing work or we're still able to um, engage in other tasks. So I love my crock pot. <laughs> um, I also... Um, you know, there's ways that you can put on meals. Like I cut up uh, some stew meat and some bison stew meat and I put it into my crock pot with some sweet potatoes and some poblano peppers and some bone broth and just let it work all day at cooking down that stew meat till it was nice and tender. And by the end of the day, when I was done working, I had a nice bison sweet potato poblano stew. Um, that's something that a little bit of work at the beginning of the day but by the end of the day when I was tired it was ready to go. Um, I also love my Instapot <laughs> which I didn't think I would. I spent a lot of time sitting in a box after I got it for a birthday present gift and finally I was like I better go figure out how to do this and so I had, I had an elk roast the other day. I threw it in the Instapot with some elderberry barbecue sauce that I'd made um, and locked it in there for like an hour and it did the work of uh, basically eight hours of slow cooked time. And so I was able to kind of just throw everything, set it aside, go do something else, come back. And now I have like a uh, shredded elk barbecue meat I could put on sandwiches or whatever. Um, that's also, it's the same way you can make um, like butternut squash and really slow or roast that squash for a soup or for whatever in an Instapot in about 15 minutes, what takes like an hour and 15 in an oven. 
So I find ways to do that. I use my rice cooker for wild rice. Um, I use these tools that we have access to because I think native people have always used the tools that we have access to. I think using our modern kitchens is part of demonstrating that resilience and being able to showcase that we are 21st century people. And this isn't like colonizing of food systems so much as re-indigenizing our food system. We're taking everything um, that our ancestors have known and we're putting them into that modern context and using them to fuel our bodies today. Wonderful, wonderful. Here's a similar question. Um, it says, I have a large family. Cooking times can be a nightmare after work most of the time. I've adapted well over the years, but I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on meal prep with traditional foods. Um, I, was, I was thinking another thing that I do besides all of my stupid gadget hacks um, is just to cut up things ahead of time and freeze them. Um, if you have a freezer space, I think it's really helpful. I'll get like those big packs of bell peppers or jalapenos or whatever it is. Um, and I cut those up and just freeze them as like little strips in my freezer. And you can take those frozen without thawing them out and throw them right into a pan and saute them up. Um, that works really well if you're doing stir fries. Um, you can do it with a lot of food. Zucchini freezes really well. You can cut up like a butternut squash, for example, into cubes, you can freeze that. Um, a lot of times you can actually buy it at the store already cut up, but I just don't like all the plastic that it comes in. So if you have that time to just sit there and go, I'm just gonna cut up a whole bunch of squash today and be able to do that and have a big bunch of frozen squash. And you know you can throw that onto your pan and thaw it out later. It saves a lot of the cutting time, which I feel like is one of the biggest nightmares of food prep. It's just trying to get through all that cutting. Um, so that's something I think I do. Um, and then just being able to have things going concurrently. You can start your wild rice um, at the same time as you're cutting everything else and then you throw it all together at the end and you're done. Um, so I try to try to make things pretty simple um, in terms of that. And you can check out some of my recipes and um, hopefully, hopefully those seem pretty accessible to folks. Yeah, absolutely. Cannot stress enough how I like things simple. So <laughs> I can see that for sure. Um, here's another question that came in. What are your big tips for people who don't cook often and don't know where to start? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, if you didn't grow up cooking, if you weren't experimenting in the cooking in the, your, the kitchen your whole life, a lot of this can seem really intimidating, especially when you come home with like an acorn squash and you're like, all right, making food today. Because <laughs> um, that's a lot of times not how we're served food in restaurants or in cafeterias or anywhere else. And so um, I would say that if you're interested in preparing traditional foods, uh, find a recipe and hopefully find one with a video that is attached to it or find something that someone in your immediate family knows how to make and just sit there and work with them. Um, watch them make it, do little steps, help them prepare it um, or watch that video and just you know, pause, rewind, pause, rewind, whatever it takes and really start to get more comfortable. Like knife skills are big. Um, just being able to figure out what you're using, a spoon to scoop out seeds. Um, and then I remember this one girl in college didn't grow up cooking. And I walked down the hall in my dorm because something smelled like it was burning. And I went down there and this girl had a package of instant cookies sitting there. And I was like, I don't understand what's happening. How is she messing this up? And I look in the oven and this girl had gone, what's wrong? And she was like, yeah, it said to put it on a, a cookie sheet and put it in the oven. And she had the temperature right. But the word cookie sheet didn't mean anything to her because she didn't grow up cooking. And so she just had a sheet of paper, which was the only sheet that she could think of. And so she put the instant cookies on the sheet of paper and put it into the oven. And so of course the oil was melting the paper, they were falling through onto the heating element. 
it was a nightmare. Um, but she didn't grow up cooking. So cookie sheet, she didn't know that that was a word she had to look up. She didn't know that that was uh, a step that was really important. And so thinking about that, um, my neighbor in eighth grade got scared of the word saucepan on like a rice aroni package and called me to come over. And I was like, oh, it's just a pot because she'd never called it a saucepan. So just breaking down things and just getting more comfortable with it. Um, but also hopefully um, being able to Zoom call with a friend that knows what's going on in the kitchen, someone that's not gonna tease you too badly um, and can really help break things down. I think that helps because once you start realizing your basic elements of what goes into food, it becomes a lot more easy. Um, but that starting point is certainly intimidating, especially if you're looking at recipe books that are like, mince the garlic and saute it. It's like, I gotta look up mince, gotta look up saute, gotta look up all of these things. What am I sauteing it in? All of the questions. Um, it can be scary. So, look. Perfect. Go out and cook. Yeah, so with uh, about five minutes left, we'll roll, keep rolling through these last few questions that we have here. Uh, the next one here says, I appreciate you infuse education and information about the ingredients in the pad thai recipe. You mentioned that the fermented fish of the past is different from the ones at the store. What's the difference? So I didn't actually, I didn't, I'm Blackfeet. We didn't even eat fish for my clan. Um, but there are some nations that um, practice different types of fish fermentation was eaten. There's a lot of fermentation that was practiced across the continent. Um, I used a fish sauce in that recipe because I really wanted the taste it to taste like pad thai. Um, and so I uh, was careful in my description on my video to say native people did ferment fish, um, but we weren't fermenting anchovies for the fish sauce that you buy in the grocery store in the Asian food section. Um, so if you're someone that has a cool fermented fish sauce recipe from your nation, I would be super interested in it. Um, and you're also welcome to exclude that if you don't feel like the fish sauce flavor is super important to you. Um, I wanted it to taste as similar to the pad thai that people are familiar with as possible. And so I went with that. Um, but you can definitely, even though native people were fermenting fish, it's a little bit different than the fish sauce I included in that recipe. So I wanted to wanted to include that disclaimer. Thanks for reading the page. All right, next question here says, any suggestions for using and storing a huge Hubbard squash? We're gonna use it for a big group, but we are avoiding big gatherings. So if you're getting really traditional uh, with your squash preparation, there's different ways of drying squash. Um, so you can, I know there's like, it's similar to drying meat actually. So you can slice it and then either put it in a dehydrator or a really low temperature in your oven. Or actually a lot of times what was done is like a hole was poked through it and a string was ran and it was dried by the fire. You can basically dehydrate your squash. Um, if you have the freezer space though, I would cut it up into chunks if you're planning on preparing it in any way where you're roasting it or using it for a soup or anything else. Um, that's how I would save it, is in big chunks in the freezer. So the skin's already off and it's really easy to prep when it comes time for it. Um, that's what I would recommend. If you're using it and you just harvested it and you're using it in the next month, winter squash. So I don't even think you'll have any problems keeping it sitting on your counter for that time. Who knows when we'll be able to gather in groups though. <laughs> yeah, yep, for sure. All right, here's the uh, last two questions. First one is, what is your favorite way to cook bison tongue? Ooh, bison tongue. Um, I think we normally slow cook it in the oven, like in a big roasting pan, slow cook it with a whole bunch of vegetables all cut up around it. And um, I would even, I would brine it a little bit beforehand. So I would, um, you could dry brine um, with like a little bit of salt on the outside and then blot it off and you can cook it up like that with that because um, it kind of brings out the flavor and the salt gets deeper in. Um, but I like slow roasting it. Probably do it in a crock pot, but I've always done it in the oven for some reason. 
Perfect. That sounds really good. Okay. I think this will be our last one here, which is, uh, Mariah, are you able to present to schools during this pandemic, maybe a cooking presentation? If so, we'd love to set up a family night with Farmington, with the Farmington Municipal School District in New Mexico for our Native American students and families. I'd love to do it. Um, there's a booking request form on my website. Send that in or email me at indigikitchen at gmail.com um, and we can figure something out. Um, I've been doing a lot of school programs, both schools that have gone completely digital. I did a Girl Scout troop where all the girls did a cook along with me, um, which was super fun. And I'm always presenting to different schools. Um, so I love doing it. I would love to be a part of it. Thank you. Great. So with that, we do have a couple comments here. Just a good morning and a good presentation. And I think that was actually an excellent presentation. So yeah, with our less than a minute left here, uh, again, Mariah, thank you so much for jumping on. We appreciate you. Your time is valued. And of course, to everyone in our audience, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, be sure to stick around for the upcoming sessions. We'll be starting up again here in less than a minute.